that. Sarah Elizabeth Charles, what <laughs> a delight, a treat to have you here. <laughs> a delight, a treat, a wonder, it's a thrill. A wonder. But you see, it's not me, it's not my family. In your head, in your head, they are fighting. It's incredible to have you here on Soul Sisters and to meet Jesse and to connect these two worlds yeah. of music and this decade long journey that I've been on ex- exploring musicianship. And yeah. you are just the ultimate musician and soul friend, soul sister. So, this is thank you for being here. That's so sweet. Thank it's, you for having me. You've inspired what a nice me. Yeah. You have inspired me <laughs> since <laughs> class. We had class together. Mm. And I was in total admiration over you, not only as a person, because you were always so kind to me, and I was a total weirdo in school, always with the camera, and some people reacted differently. You were always so generous and kind. But your musicianship was so on this level that I just marvel at, and um, your ability to be inside the music in ways that I, I could never even aspire to. So I was always totally in you know, in awe of you, and now even more so as the years go on. So anyway, let's start here. <laughs> you were going to say, we met in school. Yeah, well, we met in school, and I distinctly remember becoming friends before seeing you with a camera, ever. Um, so I remember good. being in class That's together. Good. That's good. That is good. I saw people, which is <laughs> in the footage, <laughs> met you when you were holding a camera. So happy to hear. Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah, right. right. Yes, uh, that is true. Yeah. Who no. was that? You and Ross? A million people. Yeah, there's someone I remember. Remember that's the movie, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Got it. So it's just, it's fascinating to me and slightly terrifying because I think Dara has footage of so many of us, um, which <laughs> once we once we actually see the final product, I think some of us are going to watch and slightly cringe as you do when you see yourself on film or you listen to yourself like talking or anything. Or um, any proof of what you looked like or sounded like when you were in college. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because horrifying. We were all like for not good years aesthetically. Absolutely. Of us. Gorgeous, flawless. Music. No, that is not. <laughs> so, it's I'm not projecting. True. I'm projecting. Com- <laughs> yeah. There are going to be moments of cringing, I, I think. Yeah. But, the, but <laughs> more important than that, there's like sort of, it's going to be so cool because there's this documentation of that time. Totally. So we all have like memories of that time. And memories are great. But one of like the positive things about technology, I've I have a very uh, interesting relationship yep. to technology, uh-huh. and it's ever f- like it's very fluid, um, and I have different feelings about it at different times. But this particular like mm-hmm. element, like being able to actually film and capture something on film um, that lives in your mind, and then eventually see it back, is mm-hmm. I think going to be just really special and really yeah. cool because we've all done so much and changed as people and like our sounds have changed and our spirits have changed and our energies have changed but we're going to be able to like she's dar has been able to like freeze this like m- these moments in time for us yeah so i'm super excited to to see it do you feel like the artist that you are today is vastly different from what you imagined when she started filming you yeah i think when she um when dar started filming i still wanted to be sarah vaughn i still wanted to like sing yeah. straight ahead jazz uh-huh and i still wanted to like i imagined that for myself because that was yeah that was my freshman year of college yeah. freshman mm-hmm. sophomore year so i still had a very clear and clear image of, of wanting to be that and i'm very much not that and right. i chose shortly thereafter not to be that yeah but it was sort of it was before i started really digging into my songwriting and my original yeah. music yeah yeah um, one place i have a lot of stuff of us from is a class with janet lawson vocal rhythm section with incredible <laughs> jazz singer <laughs> janet lawson well who, what's the last you, I, w- I want to hear what that laugh is, but I'll just ex- describe. She's a, <laughs> she is a very unique, amazing spirit, and she is known as like, you know, one of the pioneers of like scat singing. Mm-hmm. Um, was nominated for a Grammy in 1982, opposite Ella Fitzgerald, who yeah. beat her Whoa. for a Grammy um, wow. for a jazz um, performance album. So th- th- that's to give you a context of how kind of our our um, our education was in in this way of like scat singing and real vocal jazz the true tradition of it and you I just I it was so beyond me and you that's the thing you got it even though you don't want to be that kind of singer now you're it's in your bones and you understood that then um so I'm curious about that laugh I'm curious about how (laughs) how you how you think now about just the institution of jazz school being such a natural musician and hearing that and, and, and not being a struggle for you but what did you gain from being in school 
Yeah, I think so. So just to explain the laugh, I just yeah. I just feel so far away from from anything mm-hmm. that um, or from what I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. Far away and close at the same time, though, because mm-hmm. it's a part of like that foundational like establishment. I think for all of us, like, and we were all inspired by it in different ways, and then chose to move into the future in different ways in in relationship to it um, and to that tradition, um, specifically like jazz vocal singing as you think of it traditionally when you think of someone like Ella Fitzgerald or Sarah Vaughan um, or Billie Holiday Mm -hmm. or the many others. Um, And Janet is brilliant uh, and taught us so much and always like also encouraged us to do our own thing. Like I I studied privately with her for a while and she was always like, keep songwriting, keep songwriting. Like let's work on these like 12 solos, but then let me hear what you're working on, like what you're writing. And so there was always sort of this like dichotomy relationship between like the tradition and making sure that it was rooted, that my education was like rooted in that. And then also encouraging me to bring that into the future. So I think that what's interesting is like about what you, what you mentioned in your perception. I think we all have like, perceptions of like other people's experience and like say like when you say it just makes me laugh too when you say like oh well you just had such a handle on it and you just had I didn't feel like that I felt like I was like my head was just above water or or that I was drowning a lot of that time Um, and I think we all feel that way and we all have things that like you know, somebody else might think, or we might be really good at putting a, putting a face on, like, oh, this is easy for me. This is like no big deal. And then inside, we're like freaking out yeah. because it's very much not. Um, so that's that's more that's that reaction as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's where that was coming. From. <laughs> so um, yeah. So what what do you take away? I guess in the technical side of having gone to jazz school as opposed to just going at it on your own. You know. Yeah, you- I think um, I think that I think that you can't like build a house without a really strong foundation um, and depending on what kind of career you want to have and what what genre of music you go into I feel like regardless um, even if you're creating something that's sort of like new and that exists as sort of like a marriage of different genres which is kind of my direction and where I what, where I've been going it's got to be grounded in something otherwise the house is going to like topple over mm-hmm. I truly believe that and if you want your career to be something long lasting which I mean I want to sing when I'm like 95 and wrinkly I still want to be singing (laughs) and maybe in different spaces I don't want to be touring then maybe but I want to be like able to like use my voice and to have enough like creative juices flowing within me and inspiration like that it's built that they're built upon that I can I can do that and I still have something to say Um, and so that's I think like what jazz was for me I wasn't I played classical piano when I was little, but I was never very good. And I always played by ear and I discovered jazz when I was like 11. So after discovering jazz, it was like, oh, okay, this is going to be my ground. Mm -hmm. Like this is going to be my foundation. What did you discover exactly? Um, I discovered that unlike classical music where like you very much have to read what's on the page Uh and it's about interpretation, but only to a certain extent. Um, Jazz was like all about interpretation. It was all about freedom and was built on like, a foundation one of the prime like prime elements to the foundation is improvisation uh-huh. and just making stuff up did a teacher introduce you to jazz or yeah yeah mm-hmm. I had a vocal teacher when I was 10 11 my mom finally let me take private vo- voice lessons and she was a jazz singer and I bought one of her albums and it was all standards and I learned like the entire album verbatim every breath every nuance <laughs> and I surprised her in class I was such a type A Capricorn <laughs> and I put the CD on and I was like I'm gonna sing along to it and I, she's gonna like know that like I really appreciate her yeah. and I'm gonna get an A it wasn't a graded class you know it was like that sort of yeah. that a sort of thing yeah. um, and I did it and she was like Hmm. And she saw something. I don't know what. And she said, oh, well, you know, I'm going to bring you. I've told the story so many times. I'm going to bring you upstairs to the jazz ensemble and you can just like sit in with them. And it was this scholarship jazz ensemble at the community music school in my hometown of Springfield, Massachusetts. And I sat in and I sang, they can't take that away from me and don't get around much anymore. Exactly like she sang it. Montina Scheider. That's her name. <laughs> exactly like Montina Sh- uh, Scheider sang it. And afterward, the leader of the ensemble, who was this. I call him a bear bear of a bass player. He was a teddy bear, and then he was also like a really scary like grizzly bear. He uh-huh. was like psh, very old school um, teacher mm-hmm. um, that like taught you like you were on the bandstand all mm-hmm. the time. It was very, it was really intense. Um, he said, okay, I guess you're in. And it was my audition. And I didn't wow. realize that wow. until after the fact. And then I proceeded to like spend a whole year of going there every single Thursday I think it was where our, oh, that's when our classes were and I would leave crying and my mom would make me come, go back you were 11 uh, yeah wow yeah and why he, would you leave crying because he pushed us you know I think he asked me 
a, like after a couple classes, he said, do you want to be a singer? Do you want to be a musician? Mm-hmm. And I was like, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? You know? yeah. And I was like, I guess a musician. That sounded, you know, like an obvious, yeah. you know, he kind of, it was a leading question. Uh-huh. Vishnu. <laughs> uh, but it was so strange. And now I under, I kind of understand like where he was coming from yeah. in that regard, especially like having students of my own and uh-huh. figuring out like what their goals are. So just for myself, it was just a really, um, for me, it was a really helpful time in like steering me in the direction that like has brought me to where I am now yeah. Yeah. Um, and helped me. and I think I was I was I'm grateful for it too because jazz speaking of like jazz school right. you know jazz school used to just be the bandstand like any you know anything right. the conservatory the idea of conservatory and jazz is really new even still um, so I'm grateful to be the age that I am and ha- have had to have had the opportunity to learn on the bandstand because he would hire mm-hmm. us like in his band and we would tour in like the New England area and do like little things and um, it was it was cool and it was helpful because we would just like get our butts kicked and it was <laughs> that was helpful to learn in that way in addition to being able to go to conservatory. And do you yeah. still see the value of a conservatory and I mean especially as a teacher now and is there a lot that you would say that you took from the later years of studying like yeah. in jazz school? I think so. I think being in New York and being in school was really awesome because you could kind of like be in New York but not really, you didn't have to really worry about the hustle. I mean, you had to worry about how to pay for school, but you didn't really have to worry about like gigging or you could kind of just like be a fly on the wall and like learn about the scene before mm-hmm. having to like insert yourself in it. So I'm so glad I decided to come to New York for school. Some of the professors at the new school, many of the professors were just like awesome and I was like, more, 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 more. And I would always ask for like more, um, which was really great. Um, I think that the institution in and of itself is still like figuring out what it is in relationship to like what the music's becoming. Um, Mm. Because it's really important to be grounded in the foundation. But ideally, like that happens before you enter college or that happens like the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then the question is like, what do you do the next two years to actually give people the space and the information and the tools that that they can then build a career on? Mm-hmm. So that's I think still the missing component in just conservatories as as a whole. Yeah. You learn so much about music, but you don't learn how to like um, as much. You don't learn as much how to actually make a business out of it. Right? Yeah, um, I learned that outside of school. I learned yeah. that um, I took a business class in school, but it's not. I don't think enough emphasis is placed on that. So yeah, I was on the subway last week, sitting next to two women who sounded like they went to music school together, and were both now further along in their careers. And one of them was on her way to teach, uh, like an intro class. I think it was at NYU or one of those schools. One of those schools. It wasn't new school because I wouldn't remember that. But anyway, it was a business class. And so they were, they had both like taken this class before and now she was going to go teach it. So they were talking about the experience they had with it as students versus how she was going to approach it as a teacher. Yeah. And, and they were complaining that like one of the teachers that one of them had 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 said like you need to like go out and network with like your resume and a business card Mm -hmm. and the one who was about to teach the class was like I'm going to make all the students do a Kickstarter campaign they don't have to launch it but they need to set it up Mm -hmm. you know and that it's all about like like I'm going to ask them every week like who have you met who have you talked to not to hand out a business card but like who have you played with just like being out there and that's all important right I mean mentorship is so huge in jazz yeah. mm-hmm. period and also huge in jazz school which is one big way that I think it um, is different from other institutional learning because yeah. there is this boundary lack of boundary almost between teacher and student because it is trying to translate that bandstand situation um, which is very informal nightclub esque and then into the classroom and I think this is where it can become very murky with boundaries and especially if we if we talk about gender yeah. um, and you know the difference between someone like Janet Lawson as a mentor and maybe mm-hmm. this this bear of a bass player who it sounds like had the best of intentions and had his own way of encouraging you um, but that can be tricky um, and so this kind of leads into um, <laughs> I ran into I, Melanie Charles, who is another dear friend from school, a fabulous vocalist, and I saw her at Smalls recently, and she was like, guess what? They're going to have a gender and jazz class at the new school. And she, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I can't believe it. And she was like, guess who's going to teach it? <laughs> <laughs> 
I was like, who? She's like, Sarah Charles. Is this true? <laughs> yes. Okay. This is amazing. Wow, there we go. The reason that she was telling me this is because when we were at the New School, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Melanie and another friend, Raquel, had sort of initiated um, gender and jazz workshops, just very kind of informal, you know, a couple times a year, you know, we had to offer like cupcakes and like hope that <laughs> 10 people would show up to these talks. Uh-huh. Um we had, you know, guest speakers and I was sort of documenting it. So um, that's that's why she shared that with me. But I was like, that's amazing. And so I'm really curious. And gender and jazz is, is sort of more as gender is more is on our minds as throughout the world. But in jazz as well, I was just at the gender and jazz panel for Jazz Fest mm. um, where Esperanza Spalding and Angela Davis and uh, um, Arnetta Johnson and VJ Iyer were all on a panel and they were discussing it. And it was fascinating Mm -hmm. so i'm super curious how you plan to put gender and jazz Mm -hmm. into a school classroom (laughs) setting create a curriculum and build an entire year around that it's i mean that's a daunting and amazing task at hand yeah um it definitely is thanks for reminding me of that Um, are you doing it hasn't started yet no it's it's happening happening. so Um, you're in the second semester uh no 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 this is the so it's a semester by semester okay class okay, offering yeah, so yeah. far we'll see what it what it grows into but um this was the this past monday was the second class oh my gosh wow. um, Tell us so about we're it. in it um and at this point in time um it's it's more of a survey course because there are so many different ways to approach yeah. this um so it has sort of uh it has a historical element a sociological element a cultural element and a personal element mm-hmm. those are sort of the four areas that i'm touching on and it's it's hard because the historical element for instance could be an entire semester. It could be a socio- sociology course in which we're doing like qualitative and quantitative research for the entire semester, um, et cetera. It could, right. it could be so many different things. Um, but I thought that it would be really important to kind of like touch on all of these areas because as a school, the new school for jazz and contemporary music is their long term plan is to make this like a larger thing. Okay. Um, so this Amazing. is uh, that's a little but it's really exciting because um you know sitting down with the dean and talking about like the formation of this class it originally started as an the idea was like okay well we'll have like a women in j- jazz course mm-hmm. um and that it never that wasn't settling with me i was <laughs> like there's something about this that doesn't feel right that doesn't mm-hmm. feel all-encompassing that doesn't feel um because I, you know, at school I studied jazz vocal performance, but then I also studied sociology and urban studies. Mm-hmm. So I was like such a fan of, and I did my uh, my final project. Your undergrad isn't mm-hmm. called your dissertation or anything like that, <laughs> but I did my final paper, like a hundred page paper or whatever, um, mini paper on uh, the institutionalization of jazz music, and did a lot of like qualitative field research uh-huh. and quantitative research, and like used like Pierre Bourdieu who's a sociologist who um, specialized in he has this book called The Rules of Art Uh um, The Rules of Art Um, and it's about like the feel artistic fields um, and spaces and how people relate to each other and what's considered like high art and low art and how judgments Mm. are cast on that and all of that so I'm just super fascinated by him and think he's he's just brilliant and um, so used like his whole philosophy to like study the ja- the new school for jazz and uh-huh. contemporary music um but the anyway the more and more the dean and i spoke the more i realized like oh wait what am i as the teacher or as the lead faculty because i can't be there every week oh. um i still i'm still touring and i'm still doing all of mm-hmm. that so the way that we've structured it is um i'm there the most i'm the lead faculty and like the person designing it but we have i have guest lecturers coming in mm. um i think for about six or seven session of the 15 sessions um this semester which will be Super exciting, and we're really getting to the crux of like, wait, why does this exist? Like, let's not like, there's value for sure in coming together as like a group, a group of women, for Mm -hmm. instance, or even just a group of men and women who identify as being male or female, and like speaking about these issues and speaking about what we can do to shift things into the future. Mm -hmm. But my interest is more with this class in like zooming out um, and really getting to the crux of like, okay, well, well, why? What role has gender played in relationship to this art form? And why are women and people who are, consider themselves to be uh, homosexual, bisexual, why are these people existing still to this day as the minorities mm. in this music? Mm-hmm. And what what is this culture of masculinity that's been like cultivated and seemingly like nourished um, over the years? And 
why do we feel like we have to just survive in that? There's more, I think there's more to it. And yeah. if we zoom out and really get to the crux of like, why, uh-huh. um, then we can start figuring out. And so it's a really, that's a, I'm not attempting to do that in can one we semester. Take this class? <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, is it possible that there's footage of you guys talking about this kind of stuff at school? Oh. I have gender and jazz class. I mean, it's not this, but why? Like, like in your apartment? I think so. I mean, in a very, in a much less sophisticated way. But between way. the two of you? Uh, Maybe no. not. I don't know if we've no. ever talked okay, about okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. Because, yeah, when you were doing, I remember um, what Melanie was do, was leading, the, yeah. uh, and or what you guys were put, to get, put together while you guys were there. And I was think I think I was like early, it was early on in my, I swear mm-hmm. I can speak English. It was early <laughs> on in my uh, my time there, and I don't think I ever attended or no. ever. I mean, that's, um, that's, that yeah. speaks to the, the far, how far we've come. It wasn't something enticing or yeah. like appealing at the time yeah. um that just blew my mind i mean that sounds so amazing how has the reaction been how's the enrollment in that class it's great um it's capped at this point which awesome. is amazing and the population um is uh we've we've all spoken very candidly and openly we had like an hour and a half discussion of the first class just about personal experience and like where we're all coming from because uh-huh. i think like cultivating like a safe space in which people um can speak is going to be is really crucial and huge and just as important as like any historical context or information we might get for instance um so we've really just been like talking and sharing and getting to know each other and um the diversity of identification and also just opinion in this space is like really exciting oh to me gosh. um it's i had no idea who was going to be sitting down huh. when i went on the first day and it's just i think it's um i'm just really hopeful because this like the people in the space are the future of like not just jazz music, but just music. Like they're part of the future of music. Yeah, they're yeah. there. They're studying, and who knows what they're going to go on to create after they leave. Um, and so it's really, I feel like talking about it now is like really important. And then mm-hmm. eventually, like talking about it in high school, making it earlier and earlier, <laughs> yeah. um, because it's not just about you know. I feel like so many of us are um, have been a part of conversations in which like people have been victimized in certain ways mm-hmm. or have had to survive through stuff and mm-hmm. it's like okay well there's definitely value in coming together and feeling the camaraderie in that in that regard but like how do we get to it before it yeah. becomes that mm-hmm. um and i don't know i don't presume to like to know what but the you're answer working is. to investigate that yeah. and and i think that's what we need more of i i mean that's so fantastic to hear that you're doing that um and this I want to talk about your musicality but and your new project, but your teaching is so wide-ranging now because um, this is a real professorship at school and, and this is not the only thing you teach. So you um, t- tell us about the different things that you do because this. let's talk about the Sing Sing facility work that you do. Um, what is that? How have you come to that? And how has that impacted you? Yeah, and actually this is super related to, to the new music and to what I'm putting right. out. Like it used to exist, my teaching and my performing artist life used to exist mm. as like two just like parallel roads. <laughs> and now they've just like gotten closer and closer and it was like, oh, should I keep them separate? And then they just collided and merged <laughs> yeah. without my say. So um, I feel like when you're a songwriter too, you're writing about what you're experiencing in yeah, your life. And my teaching artist, uh, or what you perceive or what you observe, and my teaching artist, um, experience uh, specifically with with Carnegie Hall and also with an organization in Haiti called Rise to Shine um, those are sort of those were like the in- inceptions of like of uh, essentially my teaching life being merging with my performan- mm-hmm. performance life and my songwriting um, so I've been a teaching artist with Carnegie Hall for like five years now for about five years and I started as a part of a project called the Lullaby Project where we get together with um, expectant mothers or, or fathers and or fathers um, or mothers and fathers of small children and write a, original lullabies with them for their kids and for their families. Oh my God. And this has grown into like with Carnegie Hall, I'm not as involved with the Lullaby Project now, but um, it's grown into like this na- uh, nationwide initiative. And there wow. are like That's satellite so programs all over the country. Um, they've also done it a bit internationally and will plan to do it more, but there are like tens, oh, maybe thousands, I'm going to say thousands because I'm not positive about the exact number of lullabies now, wow. original lullabies that have been created f- with particular kids in mind or families in mind. Yeah, um, and it's it's done in all different circumstances because it's valid to 
all all of us in some yeah. sort of way. We come from somewhere, yeah. um, a, and a lot of the population or participant population that um, that the project works with um, are in various forms of like di- just difficult situations. So they work with the Department of Homeless Services. Um, I've done a couple uh, work- workshops, songwriting workshops um, for the Lullaby Project at Rikers Island. Mm. Um, uh, where else? They do uh, projects at Beth Israel Hospital and various hospitals in the New York area. So it's kind of, it's a really amazing project and I miss being a part of it, but <laughs> there's only so much time and I've become more involved in um, the Future Music Project, which is a songwriting project um, and other elements of music, but I'm specifically involved in the songwriting mm. class. Um, and that includes teens from all over New York City Um, And they come, they can actually physically come to Carnegie Hall now because we have a whole wing devoted to educational outreach. Um, So they come there once a week. Oh, it's like bright. thrilling. I've said that to him so many times that like, I feel like I just sound know. like the old lady. Yeah. If I could come to right. Carnegie yeah. Hall, if I could have done that when I was 15 or 14, you oh know. Oh my God, I did a Juilliard like musical when I was in a high school or middle school or cool. something. And I was and just like, this everything. is everything. <laughs> you know? This is, totally. I made it. This is the dream. Yeah. yeah well, that's and so the cool. level of talent in the space is just like, oh, wow. Ooh, and it's yeah. just so cool to like see see these young musicians come into the space and create just like amazing stuff and to be able to kind of like have some sort of part in like and hopefully like guiding them along. But um, that's something. So that's one of the projects that I'm super involved in now. And then the project at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, um, Carnegie's been at Sing Sing for almost a decade now or for about a decade. Um, so this is like this was it was all happening and up and running many years before I got there. Um, but I've I started by uh, by being a visiting artist in the space, and so I'd come in and sing. It's a songwriting project, and just like an, uh, that's what it started as: songwriting and orchestration and arranging. And now it's sort of broadened the scope to um, to be something that um, is like an all inclusive musical workshop space. Because mm. Carnegie Hall just committed another ton of years to the so project. What does that look wow. like? You go there, and what? So you, um, it, we we are there. Every other Saturday, there's another organization called Music Cambia that's a partnership program with Carnegie Hall. And so they're there every Saturday that we're not there. So really, it's music every mm-hmm. Saturday. Um, and at this point in time, in the morning, um, we have I have a partner in crime, Matt Moran, who leads the morning workshops, and I lead the afternoon workshops. And so the morning workshops are much more like theoretically based and about arranging and um, just learning like theoretical concepts. So you'll sit with the inmates and oh, yeah. talk about musical concepts and theory and stuff. Yeah, all of the musicians in the space are, um, uh, many of them are were either musicians before going to prison mm-hmm. um, or, uh, or they learned enough within the context of the program at this point that they could easily wow. work on it as professional musicians or composers on the outside. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty... You know the the range of experience is pretty wide, yeah. um, but the musician participants in the space are just um, like su- just as hungry as any of us. You know, yeah. you kind of you're working on music, so you go in and it's sort of while you're working and while you're collaborating with like because it's a whole musical community that we're com- we're included in, um, and so you f- sort of you forget where you are to a certain extent, um, and then. And then you do you remember when you leave. But like, yeah. yeah. So how? Carnegie's been able to work with Sing Sing Correctional Facility. They have a really amazing um, uh, staff that oversees the whole program and approves different things. So as long as we have to sort of submit lists, um, I'm not as involved in this part of it, thank goodness, because it's so detailed. <laughs> but like people will request certain instruments or, or certain pieces of music mm-hmm. and um, fi- they'll figure out how to sort of how to get them um, inside um, during each visit. We'll try to bring bring some things that people need. But at this point, we have keyboards. We have they have a drum set that we had nothing to do with the drum set or or the couple of amps that they have. They had that before us because it wasn't as if music didn't exist at Sing Sing before Carnegie was there either. Okay. It was very much there. I just am so unaware. Is this of a unique thing that that Sing Sing has or or is this you know, music programs come to correctional facilities more than I would imagine. Like, how unique is this? I definitely don't think it's, um, it's not common. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that, especially in a maximum security prison, it's um, really difficult. Um, It can be really difficult to get the approval. Um, And oftentimes, to be honest, you know, I think oftentimes people are really uh, hesitant to the idea because they, they think for 
whatever reason that, you know, just people will oppose like a music program coming into a prison, just like they'll oppose um, the ability for anybody in a prison to be able to get like a GED or college education Mm -hmm. because they're seeing um, they're seeing that time as being punishment for Mm -hmm. something. So why should those people be rewarded or given access? Mm -hmm. Um, And I've had that that argument posed to me when I've told people what, what we're doing there and you know what I what I say in response to that so it's it's not not common Sing Sing Correctional is very close to New York City and um, there are a lot of resources yeah. I think um, but I've been to there's another prison called Lee Correctional um, in North Carolina that um, that I've been to a couple times with an organization called Dakota which is also a Carnegie affiliate and they were there just for a week a year so that's much different than being there every Saturday. Yeah. You know, it's just a week yeah. and it's intensive and they have their own music throughout the course of the year as well, but they don't have like personalized instruction or group instruction. Right. Um, uh, I was going to say that in response to the people who who have sort of, you know, challenged what we're doing and said, you know, well, why do they, those people deserve deserve that you know I my response is is you know we have a really um really big issue in this country we are at this point I think first or second in terms of the percentage of our population incarcerated in the whole world Mm -hmm. um it's it's a real problem that we don't talk about because it's set aside you know the prison's in Austin, New York it's not in New York City it's not in the center if it were in Central Park people would be talking (laughs) um but it's not so it's sort of there's that to think about and the fact that there must be something that we're not quite doing right if that's if given who we are on the world stage Mm -hmm. if we're first or second in terms of our percentage of population incarcerated and also over 80 percent i think it's like 85 or 90 percent of the population who is incarcerated will be coming home because they're not these aren't life sentences yeah they're Mm -hmm. not life without parole sentences that's a very small percentage of the people that we're talking about and there are laws in place still as we're legalizing certain things, for instance, Uh um, that people have already been sentenced because Mm -hmm. of the three strikes rule, for instance, Mm. to um, to more severe penalties than something like sexual assault. Um, It's just really there are just a lot of things that need to change and to shift. Mm -hmm. um, And there are already people who are in circumstances that they won't be able to get out of because of Mm. how laws have functioned in the past and Mm -hmm. how our prison system has functioned. I mentioned Rikers Island and the whole Close Rikers campaign that kind of seemingly came to an end in terms of media attention yeah. last year. Um, that campaign at this point is still, uh, the plan is to close within the next 10 years, which isn't good enough. And um, it's hard because the majority of women, for instance, that we, intera- we interact with via the Lullaby Project are there without having been convicted of anything. They're there because they can't afford bail. That's the problem with Rikers, and that's why the campaign was able to get to be as successful as it was. It's yeah. not; it's a holding facility for people who are living in poverty, yeah. um, and that's not okay. And right. so, I, I don't mean to use no. this platform for that, but it's sort of it's important to just like to talk about. And I think that's the music is the music side of things is great, um, and I feel so lucky that I get to like that I'm exposed to something that I didn't I wasn't exposed to growing up Mm -hmm. and that we get to talk about it in this type of setting because of the work that Carnegie's doing so it's like really no it's amazing we often try to talk about issues like this uh with artists but it's rarely um as tangible as it is with you because of this work that you're doing Yeah. yeah I mean what's so cool is that it this music is simultaneously bringing you to these situations and and giving you these experiences Mm -hmm. and allowing you to have opinions and want to make change and also then you get to put that into music you Mm -hmm. that's actually the work that you do Mm -hmm. is actually making music about that and i imagine or i don't know how how you consider the idea of like there's so much to do and my form is music you know like that's just (laughs) such a weighty thing so let's so this segues into your album free of form is such a rich heavy powerful, empowering, uplifting, gorgeous, gorgeous, (laughs) fantastic album. And you tackle this, mass incarceration, and lots of other issues that we're dealing with. And I just wonder, you know, what is the process for you? I mean, your previous album before this was Inner Dialogue, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I don't know much about, but was probably more about your inner life. Yes. (laughs) You know, and so the change now for you having all of these life experiences and also just the world changing so dramatically. Mm -hmm. Um, Just talk about the experience of 
of writing this album? Yeah, I think um, I think that it was it's a direct reflection. Inner inner dialogue was a direct reflection of like my my internal space. You know, mm-hmm. I recorded it in like, or I wrote the music in my early to mid twenties. Recorded it, released it then. Um, so it was definitely like you know, I was a I was a young woman coming into herself, a young artist. A young Were you still human. wanting to be Sarah Vaughn? <laughs> no, t- okay. oh, definitely not. That stopped like sophomore year of college. Okay, if not before that, like freshman year. And of what college. was the? What do you say? I don't want to be Sarah Vaughn, but I do want to be more like what? I want to write my own music and carve out my own space. So I said in uh, in, in another interview recently that like it's like you're in a room and there are no doors, right? Like how do you carve out? Like I tell that I say this to artists. I said it in an interview recently. Like, how do you carve out a me-sized hole, whatever that me-sized hole yeah. is, to figure uh, out how to get out of that yeah, room? Yeah. Because people are going to try to box you in, and people right. are going to try to identify you as particular things. Uh-huh. Are you a jazz singer? Are you a soul singer? Are you sing trap music? Like, what are you? What are you? What are you doing? <laughs> and it's like, well, no, actually, like I do all of those things, and yeah. it's just it's just me, and that's yeah. okay, that. you know. But people people are comfortable with labels, and I yeah. get that. I'm I'm one of them. <laughs> you know, what you're what we're talking about. Uh, I digress a little bit, but. Inner, inner dialogue was sort of like that exploration and like putting that out there. Yeah. So inner dialogue was like, I still listen to it. And I'm like, I say, I, you know, I'm I'm really proud of of each of those moments. Albums are snapshots. You know, they mm-hmm. can't they're not continuous through time. But I, I listen to it and I'm like, wow, I was going through some stuff and I was really like laying it all out there. It's a really personal album yeah. in terms of like, OK, here's what I'm thinking about, guys. Like, here's everything. I mean, that pretty much um, is what being in your 20s is like. Right, right. <laughs> like, I'm angsty and everyone should know about my angst. Right. Because <laughs> it's epic. Because it's epic. It's epic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's valuable. Yeah. And uh, all of that. Which is not untrue. It's you not. Know? It's no, not. totally. Not. Yeah. And there's value in of like, course. I had so many conversations with people about you know about some of the subject matter and like people would be like oh I have that curiosity too yeah. like that it's curiosity it's very relatable <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's like really important to yeah. put it out there in music yes um, free of form there was more like the so the inner dialogue was the reflection of the internal free of form was the re- reflection or observations made of the external world um, because I found myself just in a space where I couldn't really look at anything else. It was like, oh my gosh, but this is right. this is happening and I'm experiencing this and I'm yeah. seeing this and I'm like reading about this and I'm, you know, and, and it also, given the political environment that, you know, that was happening and uh-huh. that still exists and that we're sort of dealing with in, in this country in particular and globally too, but specifically in this country at that time um, when I started writing, it was sort of like that's what was on my mind and my heart all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what was coming out. Um, and I think, I don't know, the free of form title, um, I guess I'll talk, because I could go like song by song and right, tell you about right, it, right, right. but I think it's more valuable to talk about the title in general, because I think that um, that sort of speaks speaks volumes, and kind of it goes back to like the time when I did want to sound like Sarah Vaughn, and mm-hmm. then realizing that that wasn't what it was going to be, and also like the progression from inner dialogue to this next record and my choices made there and where my spirit was going and following that and just sort of not boxing yourself into any sort of space Mm -hmm. or identity um, because for all of us that's like ever changing and fluid and at the core we are who we are but like just figuring out time and time again like okay well what is like the best form of that and by best I don't mean like the most happy or the the you know uh, like being able to do things really well. I don't mean that. I mm-hmm. mean like what's the most like authentic mm-hmm. form of ourselves and that's what that title is about um, because it's really cool when you think about like even if you're a twin or you know you <laughs> you are the only you right? and we have such a like a frag we have a fragment of time on this planet. It's like well what the hell are we going to do with it? <laughs> yeah. You know and what are we going to say and for me that stopped being like telling my story mm-hmm. and that started to be you know, I have this mic in front of me, whether I'm singing or sitting and talking with mm-hmm. you all. And it's like, well, what the heck am I going to use that time to talk about or say or focus yeah. my attention on? Um, and for Free of Form, that became really obvious. I was like, I'm going to talk about issues of race relation and I'm going to talk about mass incarceration. And I'm going to talk about just the concept of freedom in general. And I'm going to speak to how I feel as like a woman not in her mid to early 20s anymore, like coming into her own and feeling like, I'm. I have this like sh- newfound like strength mm-hmm. that's really cool that I never <laughs> felt like I had before, and all of all of that and more. Um, just really, yeah, yeah. Just reflecting that in the music was something that felt it was a choice, but it was more so just like a choice to follow a natural right like pull. Uh-huh. 
And it happens uh, lyrically, but also musically. There's a way that you're able to convey these ideas, not only in how you wrote your songs, but how you arrange them. And then to watch you perform them is so powerful because, and it comes across in the recorded version as well, but there's such an interplay with the musicians and such a, still an improvisational spirit to it. It isn't improvisational. Um, And there's such a just exploration of sound that, that really conveys different things at different times and I wonder how much you struggled with that or if that was the easier part or what what kind of process that was Mm -hmm. yeah my band um so my band is called scope um and uh formerly we were the se charles quartet very jazz (laughs) um no so we're called scope and we've been together for about eight years now um and so when I started rolling out this new music it's so fun like getting together and being like, okay, guys, like, let's have coffee and, like, you know, get together, like, uh-huh. next Tuesday morning and I'll have, you know, food, I'll get you breakfast sandwiches, whatever, and, like, just saying, like, okay, well, here here you go, like, here's a new song and here's a new song and just playing through them. And I remember one of the first sessions, I can't remember whether it was uh, some members of my band are Jesse Elder, Bernice Earl Travis the second, and John Davis on piano, bass, and drums. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember one of them saying, I think it was Burnus. He was sitting with my cat and he was like petting him and we played Taller, which is a song about the sort of like that feminine energy that can be so powerful in all of us because we all have it. We all have it. Women and Um, men. Women and men. Uh Um, And he said, he's like, man, like... What took you so long? Like, we're really coming into Woo. some shit now. And I'm like, yes, yeah, we are. <laughs> That's the reaction you want. That's awesome. And it was cool. And we, we were playing and we were really just like, we we were all also coming because we, I have a community of about 10 musicians that I play with as, who I consider to be a part of Scope, uh-huh. but they're the original band. Uh-huh. Um, so it was really cool to like explore with with that core band and then with other musicians and start to like shape what the music was going to be and play with songs, uh-huh. uh, sounds, I'm sorry, and introduce like SPDS and yeah. like sub kick drum into the whole mix and kind of like get into some like uh, allusion to like trap music a little bit in the music in addition to really being rooted and grounded in soul mm-hmm. and jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like, it was a really fun time of exploration and pushing boundaries and me saying like, I don't care anymore. And not, of course, of course we care as artists how other people perceive, but that used to be something that I cared about and thought about so much. Like mm-hmm. what will the community think or the fans or, what, or both. who? Uh-huh. What will anybody that hears this think of me? What will mm-hmm. my band think of me mm-hmm. when I put this song in front of their faces? Because it lives inside my mind and I think it's like, it feels good to me, but who knows what it's going to feel like to anybody else. And yeah. I, I'm i slowly realizing that that can't be that has to be something that's that's there, but it has to be like an afterthought. You've yeah. got to just create, 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 because you got to get the, all the crap out of out of there. There's a lot of bad stuff that's going to come out, like mm-hmm. stuff that doesn't really deserve to be put in front of anybody or whatever, in order for the good stuff to start flowing. And um, and again, I'm using judgments like good, bad, whatever. But you know, stuff that that is going to be more um, more fruitful, and that you're actually going to want to communicate to the to the world and to your audience, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it, and it and I mean, huge success. Just mm. so I mean, we started off by talking about you know what, what what will I do and what do you what does an artist do when they have something that they feel proud of and they're talking about and then the question comes like well what's next and you know you you're so you've become such a fully formed artist who cares about things and wants to put forth that you know important ideas within your music and grow in that way. Is that an added pressure now, thinking about <laughs> your next step, or is it just, you know, it, it's there's no different. It's it's you're gonna continue on, be inspired by the things, and and want to explore the things you want to explore. Um, how do you feel about moving forward? Yeah, I as a songwriter and a, a lyricist in particular, mm-hmm. I've been really um, fascinated with with poetry recently. Um, and so I'm kind of like Mary Oliver, Maya Angelou was one of my the first poets that I just loved. And not many people know, you know, she has, I think, seven autobiographies. People mm. know her as um, as a novelist or as a, as a writer in that sense, but not many people know her poetry. Um, and starting to get out of my own words space, because so many people have said so many things in such beautiful ways. Um, so... I've been in different circumstances recently. It's weird how the universe works, like commissioned to write um, to poetry, not those particular poets, but um, contemporary, more contemporary poets even than Mary Oliver, although she's still working and publishing. Um, 
and using their words to create sound and a sonic mm-hmm. space. And that's been really mm-hmm. cool. So I feel like my next project might might be something like that exclusively, like where the lyrics don't really come from me at all. It's just the sonic palette that's created that comes from like my creative yeah. energy space. Awesome. It's very fun so, to watch you do the loops and the vocal effects <laughs> and all the things. I mean, you're, you create such soundscapes right in front of us and then record it. It's it's really exciting. Yeah, it's fun. So who who knows? I've also thought about doing a whole album because I could do that in my apartment, which would be so fun. <laughs> like an album, putting out an album or an EP. I've been using the loop station to yeah. to write a lot as a writing tool in addition to just sitting at the piano. And yeah. that's that's my that used to be my primary, and now the loop is becoming much more a part of it just to build those soundscapes and figure out, like, okay, let me sing what I want the bass to play or let me yeah. kind of try to beatbox what I want <laughs> the drums to play or whatever. Um, and I would never do those things live, but thinking about, okay, how could I compose something that yeah. would just be exclusively that? Um, and in the studio, you can do so much more too, right? Because you don't need a looper. Right. You can just like go back in and uh-huh. you can create it live as well. I did record <laughs> my album with my TC Helicon voice live pedal, by the way. All right. Um, and we weren't going <laughs> to use it. And we weren't going to use it for the final. We got like a clean la- vo- uh, sound line and then uh-huh. we got that sound because it, for performance purposes, it was really important for me to be able to control like my own delay, my own, my own harmonizer, all yeah. that. And it was so cool because we were able to engineer at Bunker Studio, um, John Davis. His name is also John Davis, not the drummer, <laughs> but the engineer and the uh-huh. bassist. He was like so brilliant. And we were able to take that line and use it for the yeah. entire album. So the post-production was like done yeah, because awesome. all the effects were already there. Um, so I guess I could record that album if <laughs> he were the engineer. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But I have like, I have so much music. This is the first time where I have like, an excess amount of music. Oh, that's um, great. So, like, we could record, or I could record, like, next week, but that's not going to happen yet. <laughs> um, but so record going back into the studio and recording something of my own, and then a couple other projects. I have a duo project with Jarrett Turner called Tone. We're going to be recording this year, recording the next album with Ajoyo. We'll be doing that this year. Um, so... Yeah, just and then all of the other stuff, the teaching, yeah. the traveling, the <laughs> yeah, the, changing the world. Yeah, no, no, the world. It's, it's all good stuff. I don't presume to be doing that, um, but I'm like, what I'm happy, I'm happy that I'm like, and grateful that I'm doing everything that like I want to be doing. Everything yeah. I'm doing are it's things that I'm like, super excited about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it feels intentional finally, mm-hmm. which is the hustle is real. Takes a long time yeah. to get there. Yeah, yeah. Dara, sure. Dara yeah. documented I mean, a lot I of that. I was, I was in <laughs> awe of you as a musician person. Ten years ago, and now I'm just blown away by, by the work you're doing and how beautiful and important and impactful it is simultaneously. And it's a, an honor to be your friend, honor to have you here on Soul Sisters. Mm. Thank this you so much for having me. Right? I'm not, I'm not engaged yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for having me. So much love, and I'm so excited to get to know you as well. Yeah, and likewise, yeah. <laughs> you're Soul Sister now. <laughs> <laughs>